Hello FMS, we're going to take part today in a National Read Aloud Day, and we thought it would be really cool since we just watched the movie Wonder, uh, there's a companion book, or like a follow-up book, to Wonder. And if you didn't know this, it's called Augie and Me, and um, it tells the story of three different people, and it goes through three of the main characters, and what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be reading a section out of the Julian chapter. Now, if you remember who Julian is, you probably didn't like him very much. He was probably the meanest kid to Augie. And um, uh, this, this segment I'm going to read will, will paint him in a little different light. And I think you're going to see that there sometimes is a little more to the story. And while what he did absolutely was wrong and not right, um, there's a little more backstory than, than you probably know. So if you've read this book already, please don't ruin it for those that are hearing this for the first time. So without further ado, Augie and me, we're going to start on a summer vacation section in the Julian chapter, uh, which for those, if you want to read along, is on page 63. Summer vacation. My parents and I went to Paris in June. The original plan was that we would return to New York in July since I was supposed to go to rock and roll camp with Henry and Miles. But after everything that happened, I didn't want to do that anymore. My parents decided to let me stay with my grandmother for the rest of the summer. Usually, I hated staying with grandma, but I was okay about it this time. I knew that after my parents went home, I could spend the entire day in my PJs and play Halo. And grandma, she wouldn't care in the least. I could pretty much do whatever I wanted. Grandmare wasn't exactly the typical grandma type. No baking cookies for grandmare. No knitting sweaters. She was, as dad always said, something of a character. Even though she was in her 80s, she dressed like a modern fashion model. Super glamorous, lots of makeup and perfume, high heels... She never woke up until two in the afternoon, and then she'd take at least two hours to get dressed. Once she was up, she would take me out shopping or to a museum or some fancy restaurant. She wasn't into doing kid stuff, really, if you know what I mean. Uh, she'd never sit through a PG movie with me, for instance. So I ended up seeing a lot of movies that were totally age inappropriate. Mom, I knew, would go completely ballistic if she got wind of any of the movies that Grandmare took me to see. But Grandmare was French and was always saying my, my parents were too American anyway. Grandmare also didn't talk to me the way like I was a little kid. Even when I was younger, she never used baby words or talked to me the way grown-ups usually talk to little kids. She used regular words to describe everything. Like, if I would say, je veux faire pipi, uh, meaning, I want to go make a pipi, <laughs> she would say, you need to urinate? Go to the laboratory. And she cursed sometimes, too. Boy, she could curse. And if I didn't know what a curse word meant, all I had to do was ask her, and she would explain it to me in detail. I can't even tell you some of the words she explained to me. Anyway, I was glad to be away from New York City for a while, uh, for the whole summer, actually. I was hoping that I would get all those kids out of my head. Augie, Jack, Summer, Henry, Miles, all of them. If I never saw any of those kids again, seriously, I would be the happiest kid in Paris. Mr. Brown. The only thing I was a little bum about is that I never got to say goodbye to any of my teachers at Beecher Prep. I really like some of them. Mr. Brown, my English teacher, was probably my favorite teacher of all time. He'd always been really nice to me. I loved writing, and he was really complimentary about it. And I never got to tell him that I wasn't coming back to Beecher Prep. At the beginning of the year, Mr. Brown had told all of us that he wanted us to send him one of our own precepts over the summer. So one afternoon, while Grandma was still sleeping, I started thinking about sending him a precept from Paris. A postcard, or I went to one of those tourist shops down the block and bought a postcard of a gargoyle, one of those on top of the Notre Dame Cathedral. 
the first thing I thought when I saw it was it reminded me of Augie. And then I thought, ugh, why am I still thinking about him? Why do I still see his face wherever I go? Ugh, I can't wait to start over. And that's when it hit me. My precept. I wrote it down really quickly. Sometimes it's good to start over. There. Perfect. I loved it. I got Mr. Brown's address from his teacher page on the Beecher Prep website and dropped it in the mail the same day. But then, after I sent it, I realized he wasn't going to understand what it meant. Not really. He didn't have the whole background story about why I was so happy to be leaving Beecher Prep now and, and starting over somewhere new. So I decided to write him an email to tell him everything that had happened last year. I mean, not everything. Dad had specifically told me not to ever tell anyone at the school about the mean stuff I did to Augie, for legal reasons. But I wanted Mr. Brown to know enough so that he would understand my precept. I also wanted him to know that he was a great teacher. Mom had told everyone that I wasn't going back to Beecher Prep because we were unhappy about the academics and the teachers. I felt kind of bad about that because I didn't want Mr. Brown to ever think that I was unhappy with him. So anyway, I decided to send Mr. Brown an email. To tbrown at, peacher, at beecherschool.edu from Ju Julian Albans Easy mail at easymail.com regarding my precept. Hi, Mr. Brown. I sent you my precept in the mail. Sometimes it's good to start over. It's on a postcard of a gargoyle. I wrote this precept because I'm going to a new school in September. I ended up hating Beecher Prep. I didn't like the students, but I did like the teachers. I thought your class was great, so don't take my not going back personally. I don't know if you know the whole long story, but basically, the reason I'm not going to beat your prep is, well, not to name names, but there was one student I really didn't get along with. Actually, two students. You can probably guess who they are because one of them punched me in the mouth. Anyway... These kids were not my favorite people in the world. We started writing me notes to each other. I repeat, each other. It was a two-way street, but I'm the one who got in trouble for it. Just me. It was so unfair. The truth is, Mr. Tushman had it in for me because my mom was trying to get him fired. Anyway, long story short, I got suspended for two weeks for writing the notes. No one knows this, though. It's a secret, so please don't tell anyone. The school said it has zero tolerance for bullying, but I don't think what I did was bullying. My parents got so mad at the school, they decided to enroll me in another school next year. So, yeah, that's the story. I really wish that the student had never come to Beecher Prep. My whole year would have been so much better. I hated having to be in his class. He gave me nightmares. I would still be going to Beecher Prep if he hadn't been there. It's a bummer. I really liked your class, though. You were a great teacher, and I wanted you to know that. Well, I thought it was good that I hadn't named names, but I figured he'd know who I was talking about. I really didn't expect to hear back from him, but the very next day when I checked my inbox... There was an email from Mr. Brown. I was so excited. Hi, Julian. Thanks so much for your email. I'm looking forward to getting to the gargoyle, gargoyle postcard. I was sorry to hear that you wouldn't be coming back to Beecher Prep. I always thought you were a great student and a gifted writer. By the way, I love your precept. I agree. Sometimes it's good to start over. A fresh start gives us the chance to reflect on the past, weigh the things we've done, and apply what we've learned from those things to the future. 
If we don't examine the past, we don't learn from it. As for the kids you didn't like, I do think I know who you're talking about. And I'm sorry the year didn't turn out to be a happy one for you, but I hope you take a little time to ask yourself why. Things that happen to us, even the bad stuff, can often teach us a little bit about ourselves. Do you ever wonder why you had such a hard time with these two students? Was it perhaps that their friendship bothered you? Were you troubled by Augie's physical appearance? You you mentioned that you started having nightmares. Did you ever consider that maybe you were just a little bit afraid of Augie, Julian? Sometimes fear can make even the nicest kids say and do things that they wouldn't ordinarily say or do. Perhaps you should explore these feelings further. In case, I, I, in any case, I wish you the best of luck in your new school, Julian. You're a good kid. You're a natural leader. Just remember to use your leadership for good, please. Don't forget, always choose kind. I don't know why, but I was so, so, so happy to get that email from Mr. Brown. I knew he would be understanding. I was so tired of everyone thinking that I was this demon child, you know? It was obvious that Mr. Brown knew that I wasn't. I reread his email like 10 times, smiling from ear to ear. So, Grandmere asked me. She had just woken up and was having her breakfast, a croissant from in a cafe au latte, uh, delivered uh, from downstairs. I haven't seen you happy all summer long. What is it that you are reading, mon cher? Oh, I I got an email from one of my teachers, I answered. Mr. Brown. From your old school? She asked. I thought they were all bad, those teachers. I thought it was good riddance to all of them. Grandmere had a thick French accent that was hard to understand sometimes. What? Good riddance, she repeated. Never mind. I thought their teachers were all stupid there. The way she pronounced stupid was kind of funny. Like stupid. Uh, Not all, Grandmere. Mr. Brown, I answered. So what did he write you to make you so happy? Oh, nothing much, I said. It's just, I thought everyone hated me. But now... I know that Mr. Brown doesn't. Grandmere just looked at me. Why would everyone hate you, Julian? She asked. You're such a good boy. I don't know, I answered. Read me the email. Uh, no, Grandmere. Read, she commanded, pointing her finger at the screen. So... I read Mr. Brown's letter aloud to her. Now, Grandmere knew a little bit about what had happened at Beecher Prep, but I don't think she knew the whole story. I mean, I think Mom and Dad told her the version of the story that they told everybody else, with maybe a few more details. Well, Grandmere knew that there were a couple of kids who had made my life miserable, uh, for instance, but she really didn't know the specifics. She knew I'd gotten punched in the mouth, but she didn't know why. If anything, Grandmere probably assumed that I was the one getting bullied, and that's why I was leaving school. So there were parts of Mr. Brown's email that she really didn't understand. What, what, What does he mean, she said, squinting as she tried to read off my screen. Augie's physical appearance? Cassé, cassé? One of the kids that I didn't like, Augie, he had like this awful facial deformity, I said. It, it was really bad. He, he actually, he looked like a gargoyle. Julian, she said. That is not very nice. Sorry, Grandmere. And, and this boy, he was not sympathetic? She asked innocently. He, he was not nice to you? Was he a bully? I thought about that. No, he, he wasn't a bully. So 
Why did you not like him? I shrugged. I don't know. He just got on my nerves, Grandmere. Well, what do you mean you don't know? She asked quickly. Your parents told me you were leaving school because of some bullies. No. You got punched in the face. No. Well, yeah, I got punched, but, but not by the deformed kid, but by his friend. Ah, so his friend is the bully. No, not exactly, Grammier. I, I can't say they were bullies, Grammier. I mean, it wasn't like that. We just, we just didn't get along, that's all. We hated each other. It's kind of hard to explain. You, you kind of had to be there. Um, here, let me show you what he looked like. Then maybe you'll understand a little better. I mean, not to sound mean, but it was really hard having to look at him every day. He gave me nightmares. So I logged on to Facebook, and I found our class picture and zoomed in on Augie's face so she could see it. She put her glasses on to look at it and spent a long time studying his face on the computer screen. I thought she would react the way Mom had when she reacted when she first saw a picture of Augie. But she didn't. She just nodded to herself. And then she closed my laptop. Pretty bad, huh? I told her. She just looked at me. Julian, I think maybe your teacher is right. I think you were afraid of this boy. What? No way. I, I'm not afraid of Augie. I mean, I didn't like him. In fact, I kind of hated him, but not because I was afraid of him. Sometimes we hate the things we are afraid of, she said. I made a face like she was talking crazy. She took me by the hand. Julian, I know what it is like to be afraid. And she said this, holding a finger up to her face. There was a little boy that, that I was afraid of when I was a little girl. Let me guess, I answered, sounding bored. I bet he looked just like Augie. Grandmere shook her head. No, his face was fine. So why were you afraid of him, I asked. I tried to make my voice sound as disinterested as possible, but Grandmere ignored my bad attitude. She just sat back in her chair, her head slightly tilted. I could tell by looking into her eyes that she had gone somewhere far, far away. Grandmere's story. I was a very popular girl when I was young, Julian, said Grandmere. I had many friends. I had pretty clothes. As you can see, I have always liked pretty clothes. She waved her hands down her sides to make sure I noticed her dress. She smiled. I was a frivolous girl, she continued, spoiled. When the Germans came to France, I hardly took any notice. I knew that some Jewish families in my village were moving away, but my family was so cosmopolitan. My parents were intellectuals. They were atheists. We didn't even go to the synagogue. She paused there and asked me to bring her a wine glass, which I did. She served herself a full glass of wine, as she always did, even offered me some. And as I always did, I said, non merci. Like I said, mom would go ballistic if she knew half the stuff that Grandmere did. Well, there was a boy at my school and called, well, they called him Tortio. She continued. He was, how do you say the word? A crippled. Is that how you say it? Um, I don't think people use that word anymore, Grandmere. I said, it's not exactly politically correct, if you know what I mean. She flicked her hand at me. Americans, always so coming up with new words that we can't say anymore. <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, uh, Tortel's legs were deformed. From the polio, he needed two canes to walk with, and his back was all twisted. I think that's why they called him Tortio, which means crab. 
He walked sideways like a crab. I, I know it sounds very harsh, but children were meaner in those days. I thought about how I called August the freak behind his back, but at least I never called him that to his face. Grandmere continued talking. I have to admit, at first, I wasn't into her telling me one of her long stories, but I was kind of getting into this one. Tortillo was a little thing, a skinny thing. None of us ever talked to him because he made us so uncomfortable. He was so different. I never even looked at him. I was afraid of him. I was afraid to look at him or to even talk to him. Afraid that he would accidentally touch me. It was easier to pretend that he just didn't exist. She took a long sip of her wine. One morning, a man came running into our school. I knew him. Everyone did. He was Marquis, the partisan. Do you know what that is? He was against the Germans. He rushed into the school and he told the teachers what the Germans were coming and to take all the Jewish children away. What? What is this? I could not believe what I was hearing. The teachers in the school went around to all the classes and they gathered all the Jewish children together. We, we were told to follow Marquis into the woods. We were going to go hide. Hurry, hurry, hurry. I think there may be ten of us in all. Hurry, hurry, escape. Cranmere looked at me to make sure that I was listening, which, of course, I was. It was snowing that morning. It was very cold. And all I could think of was, if I go into the woods, I will ruin my shoes. I was wearing those beautiful new red shoes that Papa had brought me. You see, as I said before, I was a frivolous girl. Perhaps even a little stupid. But this is what I was thinking. I did not even stop to think. Well, where is Mama? Where is Papa? If the Germans were coming for the Jewish children, had they come for the parents already? This did not occur to me. All I could think about were my beautiful shoes. <laughs> so instead of following the Maquis into the woods, I snuck away from the group and went to hide inside the bell tower of the school. There was a tiny room up there full of crates and books, and there I hid. I remember thinking I would go home in the afternoon after the Germans came and tell Mama and Papa all about it. This is how stupid I was, Julian. I nodded. I, I couldn't believe I'd never heard this story before. And then the Germans came, she said. There was a narrow window in the tower. I could see them perfectly. I watched them run into the woods after the children. And it did not take them very long to find them. They all came back together. The Germans, the children, and the Maquis soldier. Grab your paws. Blinked a few times. And then she took a deep breath. They shot the Maquis in front of all the children, she said quietly. He, he fell so softly, Julian, into the snow that the children, they all cried. They, they cried as they were led away in a line. Well, one of the teachers, Mademoiselle Petrigine, she went with them, even though she wasn't Jewish. She said she would not leave her children. No one ever saw her again. Poor thing. By now, Julian, I had awakened from my stupidity. I was not thinking of my red shoes anymore. I was thinking of my friends who'd been taken away. I was thinking of my parents. I, I was waiting till nighttime so I could go home to them. But not all the Germans had left. Some stayed behind along with the French police. They were searching the school. And then I realized they were looking for me. Yeah, for me. And for one or two other Jewish children who had not gone into the woods. I realized then that my friend Rachel had not been among the Jewish children who were marched away. Nor Jacob, a boy from another village who all the girls wanted to marry because he was so handsome. Where were they? They must have been hiding just like I was. 
Then I heard creaking, Julian, up the stairs. I heard footsteps up the stairs coming closer to me. I was so scared. I, I tried to make myself as small as possible behind the crate, and I hid my head under a blanket. Here, Grimir covered her head with her arms to show me how she was hiding. And then I heard someone whisper my name. She said, but it was not a man's voice. It was a child's voice. Sarah, the voice whispered again. I peeked out from the blanket. Tortio, I answered, astonished. I was so surprised because in, in all the years I had known him, I don't think I had ever said a word to him. Nor had he said one to me. And yet there he was calling my name. They will find you here, he said. Follow me. So I did follow him, for by now I was terrified. He led me down a hallway into the chapel of the school, which I had never really been to before. We went back to the, to the back of the chapel, and there was a crypt. All of this was new to me, Julian, and we crawled through the crypt so the Germans would not see us through the windows because we were they were looking for us still. I heard when they had found Rachel. Oh, I heard her screaming in the courtyard as they took her away. <laughs> Poor Rachel. Tortillo took me down to the basement beneath the crypt. There must have been 100 steps at least. They were not easy for Tortillo. As you can imagine, with his terrible limp and his two canes, but he hopped down the steps two at a time, looking behind him to make sure that I was following. Finally, we arrived at a passageway. It was so narrow, we had to walk sideways to get through. And then we were in the sewers, Julian. Can you imagine? Oh, I knew instantly because of the smell, of course. We were knee-deep in refuse. You can imagine the smell. Huh. So much for my red shoes. We walked all night, Julian. It was so cold. Tortiodo, he was such a kind boy. He gave me his coat to wear. It was, to this day, the most noble act anyone has ever done for me. And he was freezing too. But he gave me his coat. I was so ashamed for the way that I had treated him. Oh, Julian, I was so ashamed. She covered her mouth with her fingers and swallowed. Then she finished the glass of wine and poured herself another. The sewers, they led to the Danavillers, a little village about 15 kilometers away from Obervillers. Maman and Papa had always avoided this town because of the smell. The sewers from Paris drained into the farmland there. We wouldn't even eat the apples in the Dan grown in the, the Danivirs. But it's where Totier lived. He took me to his house, and we cleaned ourselves by the well. And then Tortillo made me t or brought me to the barn behind his house. He wrapped me up in a horse blanket and told me to wait. He was going to get his parents. No, I pleaded. Please don't tell them. I, I was so frightened. I wondered if they, when they saw me, that they would call the Germans. You know, I had never met them before. But Tortillo left. And a few minutes later, he returned with his parents. They looked at me. I must have seemed quite pathetic there, all wet and shivering. His mother, Vivian, she put her arms around me to comfort me. Oh, Julian, that hug was the warmest thing I have ever felt. I cried so hard in this woman's arms because I knew then I... I knew I would never cry in my own mama's arms again. 
I, I just knew it in my heart, Julian. And I was right. They had taken Mama in the same day, along with all the other Jews in the city. My father, who had been uh, hard at work, had been warned that the Germans were coming, and he managed to escape. He was smuggled to Switzerland, but it was too late for Mama. She was deported that day to Auschwitz. I never saw her again. My beautiful mama. She took a deep breath there. She just shook her head. Tortillo. Grammir was silent for a few seconds. She was looking into the air like she could see it all happening again right there in front of her. And I understood why she never talked about this before. It was really hard for her. <sighs> Tortillo's family, they hid me for two years in that barn, she continued. Even though it was so dangerous for them, we were literally surrounded by the Germans. And the French police had large headquarters in Danivir's. But every day I thanked my maker for the barn that was my home, and the food that Tortillo managed to bring me, even when there was hardly any food to go around. People were starving in those days, Julian, and yet they fed me. It, it was a kindness that I will never forget. It is always brave to be kind, but in those days, such kindness could cost you your life. Grandmere started to get teary-eyed at this point, and she took my hand. The last time I saw Tortillo was two months before the liberation. He had brought me some soup. It, it wasn't even soup. <laughs> it was water with just a little bit of bread and onions in it. We had both lost so much weight. I was in rags. <laughs> so much for my pretty clothes. Even so, we managed to laugh, Tortillo and I. We laughed about things that happened in our school. Even though... I could not go there anymore, of course. Tortillo still went every day. At night, he would tell me everything that he had learned so that I would stay smart. He would tell me about all my old friends, too, and how they were doing. They all still ignored him, of course, and he never revealed to any of them that I was still alive. No one could know. No one could be trusted. But Tortillo was an excellent narrator. And he made me laugh <laughs> a lot. He could do wonderful imitations. And he even had funny nicknames for all my friends. Imagine that. Tortillo was making fun of them. <laughs> I, I, I had no idea you were so mischievous, I told him. All those years, you were probably laughing at me behind my back too. <laughs> laughing at you, he said? <laughs> Never. I, I, I had a crush on you, so I never laughed at you. Besides, I only laughed at the kids who made fun of me. You never made fun of me. You, uh, you just ignored me. But, but I called you Tortillo. And so, everyone called me that. I really don't mind. I like crabs. Oh, Tortillo. <laughs> I'm, I'm so ashamed. I answered, and I remember, I covered my face with both hands. At this point, Grand Mir covered her face with both hands. Although her fingers were bent with arthritis now, I could see her veins. I pictured her young hands covering her face so many years ago. Tortillo, he took my hands in his own hands. She continued slowly removing her hands from her face. And he held my hands for a few seconds. I, I was 14 years old then, and I, I had never kissed a boy, Julian, but, but he kissed me that day. Grandmere closed her eyes, and she took a deep breath. After he kissed me, I said to him, I don't want to call, me, call you to Tortillo anymore. 
What's your real name? Grandmere opened her eyes and looked at me. Can you guess what he said? She asked. I raised my eyebrows as if to say, no, how would I know? Then she closed her eyes again and smiled. He said, my name is Julian. Oh my God, I cried. That, that, is that why you named dad Julian? Even though everyone called him Jules, that was his name. Oui, she said, nodding. And, and I'm named after dad, so, so I'm named after this kid. That's so cool. She smiled and she ran her fingers through my hair. But she didn't say anything. Then I remembered her saying, the last time I saw a tortilla. So, so what happened to him, Grandma? What, what happened to Julian? Almost instantaneously, tears started to roll down Grandmere's cheeks. The Germans took him, she said. That same day, he was on his way to school. They were making another sweep of the village that morning. By now, Germany was losing the war, and they knew it. But, 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 but he wasn't even Jewish, Grandmere. They took him because he was crippled, she said between sobs. I, I'm sorry. I, I know you told me that the word is a bad word, but I don't know another word in English. He was uh, invalid. That, that, that is the, the word in French, and, and that is where, why they took him. He was not perfect. She practically spat out the word. They, they took all the imperfects from the village that day. It was a purge. The gypsies, the shoemaker's son who was, who was simple, and Julian, my tortillo. They put him in a cart with the others. And then he was put on a train to Drancy. And from there to Auschwitz, like my mother. We heard later from someone who saw him there that they sent him to the gas chambers right away, just like that. Poof. He was gone. <laughs> my savior. My little Julian. She stopped to wipe the tears from her eyes with a handkerchief. Then she drank the rest of her wine. His parents were devastated, of course. Mr. Beaumier and Mrs. Beaumier, she continued, we, we didn't find out he was dead until after the liberation. But we knew. We knew. She dabbed her eyes. I lived with them for another year after the war. They treated me like a daughter. They were the ones that helped me track down Papa, although it took some time to find him. So much chaos in those days. When, when Papa was finally able to return to Paris, I went to live with him. But I always visited the Beaumiers, even though they were very old. I never forgot the kindness that they showed me. She sighed. She had finished her story. Grandmere, I said a few minutes later, that, that's like the saddest thing I've ever heard. I, I didn't know you were in the war. I mean, Dad's never told me about any of this. She shrugged. I think it's very possible that I never told your father this story, she said. I... I don't like to talk about sad things. You know, in some ways, I'm still the frivolous girl that I used to be. But when I heard you talking about that little boy at your school, I could not help but think of Tortillo and how afraid I had once been of him and how badly I had treated him because of his de deformity. Those children had been so mean to him, Julian. It, it breaks my heart to even think of it. When she said that, I don't know. Something just, just kind of broke inside me. Completely unexpected. I, I, I looked down and, and all of a sudden, I, I just I started to cry. 
And when I started to cry, I, I don't mean just a few tears rolling down my cheeks. I mean like full-scale, snot-filled crying. Julian, she said softly. I shook my head and covered my own face with my hands. I, I was terrible, Grandmere, I whispered. I, I was so mean to Augie. I, I'm so sorry, Grandmere. Julian, she said again, look at me. No, I said. Look at me, mon cher. She took my face in her hands and she forced me to look at her. I felt so embarrassed. I really couldn't look her in the eyes. Suddenly, that word that Mr. Tushman had used, that word that everyone kept trying to force on me, it came at me like a shout. Remorse. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, there it was. That word in all its glory. Remorse. Man, I was shaking with remorse. I was crying with remorse. Julian, said Grandmere, we all make mistakes, mon cher. No, no, Grandmere, you don't understand, I answered. It wasn't just one mistake. I was those kids who were mean to Tortillo. I was the bully, Grandmere. It was me. She nodded. I called him a freak, Grandmere. I laughed behind his back. I left him mean notes. Mom kept making excuses for why I did that stuff, but, but there wasn't any excuse. I just did it. I didn't even know why. I don't even know. I was crying so hard, I couldn't even speak. Grandmere just stroked my head and hugged me. Julian, she said softly, you are so young. The things you did, you know they were not right. But that doesn't mean you are not capable of doing right. It only means you chose to do wrong. This is what I mean when I say you made a mistake. It was the same thing with me. I made a mistake with Tortillo. But the good thing about life, Julian, is that now we can fix our mistakes sometimes. We learn from them. We get better. <laughs> I never made a mistake like the one I made with Tortillo again. Not with anyone. Not anyone in my entire life. And I have had a very, very long life. You will learn from your mistake too. You must promise yourself that you will never behave like that with anyone else ever again. One mistake does not define you, Julian. Do you understand me? You simply must act better next time. I nodded. But I still cried for a long, long time after that. That night, I dreamt about Augie. I don't remember the details of the dream, but I think we were being chased by the Nazis. Augie was captured, but I had a key to let him out. And in my dream, I think I saved him. Or, or maybe that's what I told myself when I woke up. I, Sometimes it's hard to know with dreams, but, I mean, in this dream, the Nazis all looked like Darth Vader's imperial officers, at least, and I don't know. It's hard to put too much meaning into a dream, but, but what was really interesting to me was, when I thought about it, is that it had been a dream, not a nightmare. And in the dream, Huggy and I were on the same side. I woke up super early because of the dream, and I didn't go back to sleep. I kept thinking about Augie and Tortillo, Julian, the heroic boy that I'm named for. It's weird. This whole time I'd been thinking about Augie like, like he was my enemy. But when Grandmere told me the story, I, I don't know. It all kind of just sank in with me. I kept thinking of how ashamed the original Julian would be to know that someone who carried his name had been so mean. I kept thinking about how Grandmere was, was when she told the story. 
how sad she was. How she could remember all the details, even though it happened like, like 70 years ago. 70 years! Would Augie remember me in 70 years? Would he still remember all the mean things that I called him? I don't want to be remembered for stuff like that. I want to be remembered the way Grandmere remembers Tortillo. Hmm, Mr. Tushman, I get it now. R E M O R S E. Remorse. Hmm. I got up as soon as it was light out and I wrote this note. Dear Augie, I want to apologize for the stuff I did last year. I've been thinking about it a lot. You didn't deserve it. I wish I could have a do-over. I would be a lot nicer to you. I hope you don't remember how mean I was when you're 80 years old. Have a nice life. Julian. P.S. If you're the one who told Mr. Tushman about the notes, don't worry. I don't blame you. When Grandmere woke up that afternoon, I read her note. I read her the note. I'm proud of you, Julian, she said, squeezing my shoulder. Do you think he'll ever forgive me, Grandmere? She thought about it. Well, that's up to him, she answered. In the end, mon cher, all that matters is that you forgive yourself. You are learning from your mistake, like I learned with Tortillo. Do you think Tortillo would forgive me, I asked? If, if he knew that his namesake had been that mean? <laughs> she kissed my hand. Oh, yes. Tortillo would forgive you, she answered. And I could tell she meant it. <laughs>